notes. Uh, number one, uh, if you could um, uh, please put yourself on mute, uh, that would be helpful. Um, the preference would probably be that you would be off video because uh, we'll give uh, Liz the, the time there in the space. Uh, you can um, uh, put her in speaker view so she can take up your whole screen. How's that, Liz? What should be like to be on everybody's whole screen? Man, uh, maybe I should have put on makeup or something this morning. <laughs> not, not your caught, so we got you. Uh, but let me let me open our time in prayer, and then I'll, then I'll introduce Liz to us. Father, we just want to say thank you as we uh, begin this time. Uh, Lord, thank you for Liz and the and the folks at Nikeo and the good work they do. And uh, we just so appreciate them. I, I pray that you'd bless them as they continue to serve uh, others. Uh, for our time, Lord, I, I pray that you'd bless our time together here as we um, hear what, uh, what Liz has for us on this topic of uh, relational minimalism. Maybe some of us are here today curious about what that entails. Uh, maybe others uh, know a little bit more about this, but we want to know more. Um, but I'm just glad we're all here. And so I, I do pray, Father, that our that our hearts are soft and tender and teachable to what uh, we might glean today uh, to, to strengthen our relationships that we do enjoy and even to expand them. And so as we begin, Lord, we want to commit this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I really don't feel like Liz needs much of an intro because she's uh, been a, a big uh, help to us these past 18 plus months as we walk through the pandemic. But I, I, some of you may have not seen her yet, so I'll tell you a little bit about her. She's a licensed professional counselor. She's a, a board approved supervisor. Uh, she earned her master's degree from D uh, Denver Seminary uh, in youth ministry, but she's been working on, with church teams, uh, providing leadership to various ministries. About 17 years ago in 2005, uh, she started Nikeo, which is the, the Greek word meaning to, to have victory over or to overcome. Uh, and that's what she's been really helpful to a lot of our folks that uh, have seen her and, and folks on her team. Uh, so she's done a great job for us. We've had her talking about different issues uh, during the pandemic, how we could navigate this time uh, working from home, being disconnected from people. And we've just had great feedback about her. So that's why we wanted to bring her back again today. So with that, Liz, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And again, thank you so much for the investment you make uh, for our team. Um, and we're absolutely looking forward to today. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. I actually enjoy doing this. Um, so, and I find that around the holidays, it can be really helpful, just even in light of the topic that I thought might be helpful to talk about, because it's a topic I'm talking about, you know, most days in the office that sometimes just kind of anxiety or just even stress can start to increase. And so there's a, a new term, uh, newer within the last kind of couple of years, I consider that newer called relational minimalism. And I wanna, I wanna define what that is, but I wanna start with just the, the term minimalism, which has been around forever, which is basically embracing less for the purpose of improving our lives. So minimalism can, you know, mean a lot of different things. And um, I don't know if you guys remember a book that came out in 2014, um, a gal by the name of Marie Kondo. And so she came up with this whole method called KonMari, which there's five components to it. But the, the title of her, it was a New York Times bestseller. And it was, it was entitled The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. Okay. I mean, it just went off the charts. I even had clients that was reading it and they would, you know, take pictures of, oh my gosh, this is life-changing. I'm going in my life and you know for her it was kind of material possessions and you know if we if we really practice this our method that it will transform our lives and so one of the components to this this method was was keep only spark joy so actually i'm not even recommending that you guys read this book but i am saying i thought that was so that, you know, if you're going through and you're minimizing your life and you hold up an item and you're like, does this spark joy for me? And again, a lot of people tended to think, okay, this is t totally cheesy. But what happened is that movement, the KonMari movement began to prompt different psychologists and counselors, even lots of bloggers to start thinking about relationships in a similar way. And so they were thinking, you know, well, if a relationship, if you kind of hold it up, you examine it, who's this person in my life, whether it's in my personal family life, believe it or not, family life, sometimes it's a coworker. But if that, that relationship doesn't really spark joy for me, I, I can just get rid of it. So these articles are getting published and these bloggers are writing about it. They're showing up on the internet about the benefits of cutting certain types of people out of our lives. And so I thought, well, how interesting to think about 
this in light of the holidays coming up, more things on our calendar, you know, work, Christmas parties, family get togethers, all that stuff. And so, you know, these people that, that might, we might be tempted to cut out of our life. They don't spark joy for us. They might be difficult. They might even be toxic. And I'm going to talk about the difference between those two things because they're very different, having difficult people in our lives versus toxic people. They may be high maintenance people. They may be super negative. Um, the big thing right now that we're seeing everywhere is when people have different political or religious views than us. Um, there's a lot of that, hey, this person no longer sparks any joy. And so I just need person out of my life. So, you know, again, what do, what do we do when we might be tempted to say, I don't want to embrace that person because they don't improve my life at all. And that can be really dangerous in light of, you know, as a believer, um, we all have difficult people. We may not all have a toxic person in our life, but we've all had difficult people in our life. And this is talked about through the Old and New Testament as well. And then there is the second commandment. So we know the first commandment, right, is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. Um, but then the second commandment, very close to that, and it's love our neighbor as ourself. This is in Matthew 7. So we live in this really divided world. We are in a divided world. We're in a divided church. Even church denominations are divided. We're in divided families, relationships. And you guys have heard me say before, for those who have hopped on in past talks, you know, I do think that the enemy's two biggest tools that he uses are divisiveness and discouragement. And, and I, I tend to think that is holding true. And so when I look at our, in our world and our families and relationships, I'm like, oh, wow, look what's happening here. We are becoming more divided. And I think there's a lot of discouragement that's going on. And so again, then we've got these psychologists and these bloggers that are going back to, okay, relational minimalism. We need to examine that person. And if they don't spark any joy for us, or if they're difficult in any way, or they have different views than we do, we just get rid of it. Thinking that that's actually going to transform a person in their life. And then as a believer, I would say, I think that God intentionally uses difficult people in our, in our lives. And even though we can have different opinions about all that's happening around us, I don't think that's bad. I really don't. I think that we have to learn not just tolerance of people, but actually this acceptance of people that might be difficult or toxic. And I'm going to kind of give you a way to learn how to do that um, because we all have difficult people in our life. Um, I actually want you guys thinking about somebody right now who, as the holidays are coming, you're thinking, oh man. And it may be just somebody that's just more annoying to you that you know you're going to have to be around to somebody that maybe you yourself have been like, yep, I'm not going to go to that, you know, Christmas party or, oh my gosh, this person's going to be staying in our home for however many days. And, and I can't handle that. So that, that's, that's how I want you to be thinking of who this person is. And then I'm going to differentiate the difference between difficult people versus toxic people. Um, and I'm going to start with toxic people because I definitely help people discern that if they have had a toxic person in their life, um, and that also means if somebody has been sexually, emotionally, physically abused by somebody, that's a different deal. I don't think that God expects, but also he desires people to feel safe and secure and not have to, oh, for the for the sake of, oh, got to love your neighbor, which means I have to love this person who actually has been abusive to me. Those are two different things. So it's really important that you guys know I'm clarifying between the two, okay? So with that, let's go into kind of toxic traits. And of course, I'm going to always throw in their Lamentations 340, test and examine your own ways, because we want to be self-aware of, oh man, am I, am I maybe struggling with some of these patterns in my life that I didn't even know? Um, so if we think of toxic people, and again, not everybody's had a toxic person in their life, everybody's had a person, but those are people that are, are abusive, they're controlling, oftentimes they're easily angered, they tend to have bully type behaviors, and by the way, adults can be bullies too, um, which means they make jokes, they're demeaning, they're belittling, um, 
these toxic type of people never accept responsibility. So they're really good at blaming and they'll be pretty overtly blaming. Um, they're typically always negative. Um, we can all struggle with gossip. Trust me, we can all struggle with that. But these folks just kind of live in it. And then they always play the victim. They, they really kind of, they're always in a crisis and they're always the ones that are wounded and they kind of carry that mantra with them. Um, they're always right. They have no ability to listen to another point of view. And again, I know you guys, this is resonating with some of you guys, ho hopefully not within your own kind of heart, but maybe so, but definitely with what we see going on in our divided culture. Um, these types of folks are, are manipulative, they lie, um, they tend to like to stir up problems and they like to see people squirm. They're unreasonable. They will twist your words. Um, they'll cause you to walk away feeling like you're kind of crazy. And that, that's a real key thing that I talk about in my office. If I have somebody come in and they're trying to discern, is this person just somebody difficult or is it, what kind of boundaries do I need to have with this person? you'll leave this person feeling worn out, unbalanced, and really bad about yourself. This person will not look at their part, of in, their part in conflict. They're not even willing to resolve conflict. They're not open to any kind of feedback. And so the person that is in this type of relationship, again, whether it's a coworker, it could be in a marriage, um, it's again, a family member, you'll consistently feel hurt. And so that's when just even as counselors, we help people figure out, okay, what, what the heck are you going to do around the holidays if you actually think this person has to be in your life? Again, this is different than a fully full-blown abusive person that usually that means a complete separation. Don't need to talk about all that stuff today, but now I'm going to go to a difficult person. Okay. And there can be some overlap. So this is not black and white, but a difficult person actually can have relationships. They get, they get along with people in their life. They rub some people the wrong way, um, but not everybody. They may not understand or recognize certain social cues. And so it can kind of feel awkward. It's kind of like, you know, we all can have like that aunt or uncle that we're like, oh man, just is a little bit weird or different. And, and again, I say this with compassion and not judgment. Um, but, you know, a difficult person sometimes can monopolize a conversation and they're not paying attention to that. They can typically complain and Sometimes they don't return phone calls and emails. They won't commit. They're not very good com committers, so to speak. Um, they do struggle with taking responsibility. Um, you know, they tend to say what you want to hear, not necessarily what they really feel. And that can make that relationship difficult. They do tend to be ungrateful and unappreciative, sometimes insensitive, um, flaky. Um, they, they, do struggle with taking responsibility, but they also understand the, the impact that has on relationships. So they, they try, again, I'm not saying they're good at it. But that also is what makes them difficult. Um, and so, you know, they can be, because of that, they can be pretty self-absorbed and not a very good communicator. And they can struggle respecting what your boundaries are. So like, even as the holidays come, if you kind of put up a boundary of, you know, hey, we need to leave at 10 o'clock. They can be that like, why do you have to leave at 10? Why do you have to leave at 10? They, they just don't understand that. And so it can make it difficult, but they, they often will have a hard conversation even if they kind of flounder their way through it, which can be true for a lot of us. Um, and they do have empathy, whereas a lot of times toxic people don't have empathy. So again, I'm, I want you to be thinking about that person that you identified in your life and whether you will be around them sometime during the next couple of months of, of holidays. And then in light of that, I, I think about the second commandment, which says, love your neighbor. And, you know, certainly love your neighbor as yourself. And then I think, you know, I, Jesus had all kinds of people in his life. And by the way, he did favor certain kinds of people, not with his love, but who he had in his life as friends. I mean, he did he did really love and like Peter, James, and John. And those were in his inner circle. You guys have heard me talk about this. He really did love and like Mary, Martha, and Lazarus because when he was traveling through, he always stayed at their home. I think they were really easy folks. I think they loved him and it, it wasn't a lot of work. I mean, we don't obviously know all the details. Scripture is very limited in what we know about the narrative spoken there. 
for Jesus to want to go and stay in their home. And then for Jesus to want to travel with these kind of 12 people. And then three of them were his best friends. It, it says a lot. And I do want you guys to know, and this is from my understanding, and you guys can certainly challenge me on it. There is no in the Bible that it says like people. Everything keeps coming back to love. And, and two words actually that are exchanged a lot interchangeably are love and mercy. And I'm going to unpack that for you too. But it, I can't anywhere see where in Old and New Testament, it's we have to like everybody. Because I'm going to be honest with you, I don't like everybody. Um, and I don't have a long list of those people that I don't like. But, you know, there's some folks. And by the way, that's in my own extended family too. Um, you know, I have challenges in my own family. And so therefore I had to differentiate, okay. And I had to give myself permission that, okay, Lord, I don't necessarily like this person, but they're going to be in my life to some degree. Okay. Cause you know, again, we don't have to have all these people in our life. I, in our life, I do appreciate how Jesus differentiated different kinds of people. And he kind of specifically said, I need you in my inner circle to help me and, and to love me. And I'm going to go through some really this, the amount of suffering that Jesus went through that we'll never go through. Um, but that's why we want to use discernment about who is in our life. And those are people that we not only love, but we like. And then we're thinking about the commandment of, okay, I got to love my neighbor. I mean, here's, here's some verses. I mean, so even Galatians 5, 14, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Hebrews 13 talks about keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. And by the way, sometimes these are literal brothers and sisters that might be very difficult for us. Um, but brothers and sisters in that, in, that, um, in that verse specifically basically means all, who, whoever is around us. And then it all go, also goes on to say, don't forget to show hospi hospitality to strangers, no less. Okay, so, and then in Philippians 2, it talks about do nothing out of selfish ambition. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Value others. But I'm still not hearing this like. So I'm hearing, okay, you know, love, show hospitality, value others. Um, John 13 is a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. This isn't like, because I think you guys are all identifying somebody that you don't particularly like. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's, there's two words that are used pretty interchangeably. And there's, you know, when you, if you study Hebrew and Greek, and I do like to study that because I like to be sure I'm keeping things in context, some words can be used interchangeably and it can help kind of bring those words more fully alive, especially for me. So when we think of kind of being merciful and loving, and I'm going to read through these, and there's still no word in there about like. So if we go into mer the word mercy in Hebrew, there's there's several different words used. Rakam is one, and it, it is in Psalm 116, and it means to love or have compassion for somebody, to have a disposition of mercy. So now we've got like being hospitable, being compassionate, loving. And then we've got a word, kaporeth. This is a Hebrew word. Um, that's very much associated with mercy. And it refers to a sacrifice that we might make that reconciles a relationship and leads to peacemaking. It's, it's probably my favorite Hebrew word, kaporeth. Because again, if we are around difficult people, certainly toxic people, we will be called to sacrifice something to some degree in order to have peace and by the way, these, I'm, I kind of pointed out, difficult and certainly toxic people won't know how to do this very well. And so therefore that's the challenge. And then of course, I want you guys to test and examine your own ways because you might be like, oh my gosh, holy cow, Liz read that list off. I struggle with some of those things. And let me go ahead and say me too, okay? I haven't, I haven't you know, conquered all of this. I won't until the day the Lord takes me home. So when I look at these scriptures though, and I'm like, okay, Liz, how well am I doing at sacrificing something so that I can live reconciled, which basically means at peace. Reconciliation means to be at peace. And, and then we've got in Psalm 18, a word that's used called kased. That's a Hebrew word that means goodness, kindness, mercifulness. 
So when I think about the holidays, okay, Lord, how will you help me be good and kind and merciful, live at peace, be sacrificial, be hospitable? That seems like an incredible undertaking, which I will tell you can feel overwhelming. Um, and then just to kind of back this up, because I always like to use the New Testament too. So mercy and love in, in Greek in the New Testament, the words are eleman, um, which is to show compassion um, or actually to have pity on. And people don't like that word pity. And, and by the way, nobody likes to feel like, oh, you're pitying me, but it's actually a really good, beautiful word of, I recognize that you are struggling, that you're not in a good place. And I still want to treat you in a way that is loving and compassionate. And there's another New Testament, uh, a Greek word, oitremos, um, which is saying this exact thing. It's showing compassion or pity. And it's kind of this divine calling that allows us, and this really means this is a part of that work, oitremos, to pass over sins. That doesn't mean that we don't acknowledge that somebody is difficult and we just pretend it's not there. It's asking for God, and a lot of times it's supernatural to help us not focus on the difficulty of that person, but to, to get to this place of acceptance. This is actually demonstrated in Luke 10. Many of us know the story of, of the Good Samaritan, okay? And so, um, you know, who is our neighbor? And, and Jesus is basically challenging a Pharisee to think through who the neighbor is. So a Pharisee once tried to test Jesus after asking him what the greatest commandment was. And the Pharisee asked, okay, so who is my neighbor? Okay, and we can, we can put any word in there. Who, who is my, the difficult person? Okay, who is this, whoever that name is? Sister, brother, mom, dad, coworker, spouse. And then instead of giving a direct answer, Jesus Christ turned the question on the Pharisee, Pharisee by telling the parable of the Good Samaritan. And the parable of the Good Samaritan tells the story of a man who was attacked by robbers on the road to Jericho. He was stripped of his clothes. He was beaten. He was left for dead. And then soon after, a priest was passing by the same road, a priest. And when he saw the man, he went to the other side and continued on his way. And then a Levite passed by, and he too moved to the other side of the road when he saw the man. But then a Samaritan came by. And just background on a Samaritan, okay, they were not liked either. They were shunned. They were considered... Um, just the marginalized. Nobody wanted to be around a Samaritan. And the Samaritan came by. This is kind of the lowly Samaritan. And when he saw the man, he took pity on him. And he put, poured oil and wine on his wounds. And he carried him on his donkey and brought him to an inn. And he took care of him there. He took care of him. He showed him hospitality and kindness and mercy because he pitied him in a good way. And then the following day, he gave the innkeeper two denarii, and he asked him to look after the man, adding that when he returns, he will compensate the innkeeper for an ex any extra expense he may have had. And after telling the story, Jesus asked the Pharisee, which he thought among the three was a neighbor to the man who was robbed, to which the Pharisee replied, and he got it, the man who showed mercy. And Jesus told the Pharisee to go and do likewise. So showing mercy, and I think you guys now have seen, it is not about liking a person. I do think God can supernaturally move us from, oh, I, I didn't really listen, and then something incredible has happened. And maybe they're not going to, they don't become your best friend, but there is this, I have this ability to, to love them as my neighbor, to be kind hearted and to be compassionate and maybe even generous. Um, I was at dinner with some girlfriends a couple weeks ago, and it happened to be a night that, I mean, it was great dinner, great fun, and, and one of the women that, that come, you know, she's, she's difficult. She's not toxic. She's difficult. Um, she kind of does a lot of those things I talked about, and she monopolizes conversation, and she could tend to lean a lot towards the gossip, and um, she's, she's not a favorite person of mine at all. And um, at the end of the dinner, she had been dropped off. She'd actually had some car problems. And so and it had started to pour down rain. And one of my dear friends that was there actually just lived a couple of blocks from the restaurant. And this, this lady that's kind of difficult asked my friend and said, would you mind taking me home? And it was like a solid 20 minute drive in pouring down rain. And my friend without hesitation said, absolutely, you bet. 
And I do know that my friend is not super fond of this woman, but again, it's not being called. The second commandment isn't liking somebody, but it is treating a neighbor as yourself, that I would want to be treated that way. And so it's this, this outward manifestation, honestly. It's when we talk about loving our neighbor, it is a visible expression, a practical demonstration, which really fulfills what Jesus was very clear about. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and love your neighbor. And so I think sometimes when we practice the outward manifestation, the visible expression, that it changes our own heart. And, and that's the transformation. So going back to kind of Marie Kondo, right? We may have held up somebody and been like, they don't spark joy for me. And by the way, there may be some people the rest of my life that spark no joy for me. Um, you know, I've, I've had some really difficult, I've, I've had a couple of toxic people in, in my life, can't choose it, the nature of this relationship, and there's not sparking joy. I've also had people that initially didn't spark joy and then God does something. And it's usually the work that I need to do, which I'm gonna go into now, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about differentiation. And when I become differentiated, which I have 100% control of what that looks like, and I'll define it, then sometimes joy can be sparked in these relationships. But as I said at the beginning, even if joy is not sparked, we don't, as believers, get off the hook of like, mm, don't have to love my neighbor. It's like, oh my gosh, Lord, how are you going to help me do this? Because that is a commandment and I can't get around it. So here's something that you have complete control over. And the word is differentiation and, and what you can do here. So when we are differentiated people, okay, we have the ability, and by the way, this is something I, I wasn't born with this. This is something I had to work on in my own counseling, okay? When we are differentiated, we have the ability to stand up for ourselves, our values, while we can simultaneously remain connected to others. So that means that, sure, if we want to express our opinion and we feel like that's a, that it's, it's loving and friendly and we have different, like a radically different opinion, we can do that while simultaneously remaining connected to others. If we're differentiated, we can separate our thoughts from our feelings. So we can be rational and logical. We still have feelings, but we don't let our feelings drive how we respond, because that usually will take us into a reaction or an overreaction. Highly differentiated people can respond to anxiety and they can cope with just lots of variables in their life. So again, have I conquered this? Have I kind of cornered the market on differentiation? No, um, I will not probably until the Lord takes me home, but I'm consistently working towards it. Um, differentiated people can stay emotionally regulated. They don't have a lot of highs and lows and they can still have a really maybe energetic um, personality. I have a dear friend that she has lots of, she expresses emotions, but she's emotionally regulated. She doesn't kind of fly kind of all over the map with emotions. Um, and again, they can have different opinions and really strong ones and still stay connected. And differentiated people are not overly dependent on people. There's a healthy interdependence because we are created to need relationship and to need love and acceptance and affirmation and to be known, but it's not this, I need to depend on you to make me feel better. Um, highly differentiated people can love people for how they are while forgiving, forgiving them for what they are not. I wanna say that again to you. This is really key. I actually highlighted it in my notes. Highly differentiated people can love people for how they are while forgiving them for what they are not. We can really desire for certain people in our life to be different. And I, I have that desire. I, I have an extended family member that's really challenging to me. I am still okay if they never change. I don't like it. It's, it has brought me sadness. I've kind of even grieved about this relationship and I'm still okay. And only through the Holy Spirit in my life have I learned how to show love towards that person. Hospitality, mercy, 
kindness, all those things. And so I can still wish that that person would be different, but I know that I can't change them. And I don't live in denial about it. Um, I continue to embrace that person with, with healthy boundaries too. So, um, okay, so now I'm going to, and this is hopefully helping you guys test and examine your ways, give just some characteristics of people that aren't as differentiated. And they often have high levels of anger towards people that are different than themselves. Um, they complain a lot about having to be around difficult people. They're typically not content. They tend to be overly dependent in relationships. They carry high levels of stress um, when there is discourse in their relationships. Um, here's what's really key. People that are kind of lower, low, lower differentiated scale, so to speak, will tend to ask a lot of questions along the line of how can I change that person? Or even I'm not going to be in relationship with that person because they're not changing versus somebody that's more differentiated, high, higher differentiated. They will ask themselves the question, what do I need to work on to improve my own functioning within this relationship? Okay, within my own family, within my coworkers, within my marriage, whatever that is. So you've got this person here that just struggles a lot more. How can I change that person? And now that the holidays are coming, I have to be around this person. And then it's all this anxiety and it's all this like fear and concern and anger versus the differentiation says, okay, we're going into the holidays. What do I need to work on that's within my control that can improve my own functioning within this relationship. And, and that's what's really key. And by the way, those are the folks that can love their neighbor as their self. It's not having an expectation of that neighbor, whoever that difficult person is, that they need to change first. And by the way, guys, I'm not, I, some of this is supernatural. Some of the, there, there is somebody in my life that I thought I could never, like it's just always gonna be a beat down to be in their presence. It's not a beat down anymore. This is not my best friend. And, and I can't imagine that that's ever going to happen. But it is as we look at ourselves and we grow in this differentiation. I'm sure I've told you about the book, if you're interested, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Pierce Scazzaro. Love the book. So if you're wanting to learn and do some self-examination about, oh man, some of these things Liz is saying, I got to work on in my own heart and mind, um, or even just you know, you feel like you know how to love well, but people are challenging to you. That book is going to address all of those things. Because the reality is that this season coming up on us does not have to look like the last one. Doesn't have to look like the one before that. We get to change. Shape and reshape dimensions in our lives. That's, that's the beauty of it. Like I'm not Second Corinthians 5 talks all about, hey, we can, every morning we can wake up and be a new creation. And the, the crud that we did and how we acted and how we used to be in relationships does not have to stay with us as we move forward. We get to choose how healthy or unhealthy we're going to be. And also we get to choose not, not about how relationships are going to be around us, healthy or unhealthy, but how we don't have to be controlled by difficult or toxic people in our lives. And that really comes through being differentiated. Jesus was the perfect example of differentiated. Um, you know, he also did have this, he was part of the Trinity and had this like supernatural ability. I don't know, maybe he actually liked everybody. I, I don't think he did. I think he really disliked the Pharisees. Um, but I also think he had compassion for them. And I think he showed mercy for them. And I think he wanted to be a peacemaker with them. And all of those things that I described before. Um, I was thinking about talking to you guys. And so good old Oswald Chambers, and I do love this book. Um, lots of things are kind of hard because he's so deep that I have to just sometimes read things over and over again. But um, this is actually a, I had highlighted this years and years ago because I've had difficult people in my life. And I read this and thought, oh man, he somehow gets it. And so I thought we could just glean some wisdom from this. Um, a, a little bit. I'm going to read just a little bit of this, but he writes this. And this is, he's, he's relaying this to um, several verses in 1 Peter 4. But he writes this If you are going to be used by God, 
he will take you through a number of experiences that are not meant for you. Hold on, sorry. If you are going to be used by God, he will take you through a number of experiences that are intentionally meant for you. They are designed to make you useful in his hands and to enable you to understand what takes place in the lives of others. Because of this process, you will never be surprised, although I always am, by the way, when I have a difficult person in my life, um, but because of this process, you will never be surprised by what comes your way. You may say, oh, I can't deal with that person, but why can't you? God has given you sufficient opportunities to learn from him about that problem or about that person, but you turned away not heeding the lesson because it seemed foolish to spend your time that way. And again, guys, sometimes we can feel like, oh, that's so foolish. I don't wanna even be around that person. And we forget the call to love our neighbor. So he, he goes on to say, when it comes to suffering, because by the way, these kinds of relationships are a form of suffering. When it comes to suffering it is a part of our Christian culture to want to know God's purpose beforehand. In the history of the Christian church, the tendency has been to avoid being identified with difficult people. People have sought to carry out God's orders through a shortcut of their own. God's way, though, is always the way of suffering, the way of the long road home. It will mean not knowing why God is taking us that way, but because knowing might make us spiritually proud. We never realize at the time what God is putting us through. We sometimes go through it more or less without understanding. And then suddenly we come to a place of enlightenment and we realize God has strengthened me and I didn't even know it. And you guys, that can happen. So when we talk about loving our neighbor and, you know, okay, we can do it the, the Marie Kondo way. And this person doesn't spark joy for me. And so I'm done with them. Or we can recognize that, okay, I'm going through suffering because of this person or this group of people in my life. And there must be purpose in it. Because as we, we know, God intentionally uses suffering. You've heard me speak on that before. For those of you guys who have logged on before, it makes us more useful in his hands to love our neighbor because that's ultimately what impacts the kingdom. So again, I go back to, first of all, if somebody is abusive in your life, we're not talking about that today, okay? That is a whole different thing. This is not like, oh, I need to go back and love that person and I need to be you know, kind and hospitable and all that kind of stuff. So there are exceptions and that's a huge exception for you to hear me say. That is different than difficult people where we may be tempted to want to practice the relational minimalism that I think you guys will start hearing that term more and more. I'm done, I'm out. Versus God, how can you help me become more differentiated? Okay, because that's, that's something that I can control. That's something that I can work on. That's stuff I talk about all, all week long in, in my office so that I can show love. So I just wanted to put that out there today, the holidays can be challenging. I had a client one time, I'll pull it out in a few weeks that gave me this little plaque and it says, I'll be home for Christmas and in therapy by New Year's. And, you know, we've got to keep a sense of humor in this too of, yeah, things, they, things can be really difficult and yet God can help me get through this. Um, so I just say that to you guys and hope that the holidays can be times of working on your differentiation. So, and I'm open to any questions, any, any things that you guys need me to clarify or, or expound on a little bit, you kind of let me know. Hey, Liz, I was really encouraged by the story about uh, the friend that you had that, um, that, that you struggled with, but then you were so encouraged by another friend that, that mm -hmm. when she requested a ride, and I, I don't want us to miss that either, that when we love people that way, it not only helps us in our relationship with them, but it also encourages others and it can even be convicted at times, I think. So I was just really encouraged. And I don't even know if in, in that moment, she probably wasn't even aware that you saw her and you were encouraged by that, uh, but yeah. you were very aware of that moment. 
Very. Yeah. I mean, this is a friend that I walk with a couple times a week and yeah, it was really convicting because I'm just going to be honest with you. I didn't want to take that gal home. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's just the stuff in, in, in my heart that I need God to keep working through. But honestly, this friend, and I, and I do know, I mean, this friend, and we don't talk poorly about this, this other woman, but you know, I do know that this friend isn't, doesn't really like her either, but she's like, this isn't about like, this is about how sometimes we sacrificially love people. And sometimes it's sacrificial and sometimes it's not, you know, sometimes we love our neighbor and we've got a great neighbor. I actually have a great neighbor, by the way. And so it's super easy to love. And when they reach out and say, oh my gosh, you know, I need this favor. Can you do this? I'm all in it. It doesn't, it's not sacrificial, but it's the people that are difficult for sure. The people that are toxic that we're like, I don't want to take that person home. And that's the calling that, you know, we can throw around these verses all the time and we tend to just sweep over them and just be like, oh yeah, I love my neighbors myself. And I'm like, I fall short. So, yeah. Yeah. Hey, feel free, folks, feel free to type in a question uh, in the chat and we can, we can ask Liz those questions. Another one I had for you, Liz, was when you think about those relationships where you, where you uh, love somebody uh, that you may not like, how, how open are you in the relationship? So for example, if, if, if I, if you found me difficult to be around, um, would, and, and you're still, you're not going to like me all the time, uh, but you're going to, but you're going to love me well, how transparent are you with, uh, helping me be different? Or do you just see that as a negative? Would you say to me, Henry, can I give you some feedback that I think might help you in your relationships? Or do you not tell me anything like that? You just try to love me well where I am. Oh, I, I love the question. And, and honestly, it's both. And so one of the things that I learned from my spiritual mentor is, again, you know, the healthier people are emotionally and spiritually, and that's what you'll read. I, I know you guys wanted the title of the book and you got it on actually pages. If you get, if you buy the book and I don't know with Kindle, which, which pages these are on, but 80 to 82 is the scale zero to a hundred that will help you really just look at yourself. Like, where am I? Am I a toxic person? Like, am I a difficult person? that scale will help you look at that. But all this say, my spiritual mentor had said to me, I mean, if they are low, low on this scale, they will get defensive. They will make it about you. It won't go well. And if they're higher, they can hear that and be like, oh my gosh, you're right. Oh my gosh. Thank you for pointing that out. You know, like I have worked really hard at being really approachable. So, you know, if I have a friend that, you know, says, gosh, Liz, you kind of came across a little, I don't know what it, it would be, but you know, um, I'm like, thank you so much. Like sometimes I have a fear that I talk too much. And so I let my friends speak into that. I was like, oh golly, help me if I'm talking too much. Mm -hmm. If somebody's really low on that differentiation scale, they'll get so mad at you for saying that and often will cut you off. Like they're just done. I mean, they can't. So the, the thing is to learn that discernment. Like is, did the door kind of open a crack yeah. for me to be able to step in and say, you know, Hey, I don't, I don't know if you're aware of this, but this is something that I've seen and I don't know, just think about it. And that's why I love Lamentations 340. You know, those people yeah. that contest and examine their ways can make changes. And those people that won't even go there, I won't even kind of open that door, so to speak. I just, yeah, that's, I just good. Mm -hmm. that's good. Hey, we had a two parters um, says thinking about this, I tend to engage with difficult people in order to do one of the following please appease or fix so are yeah. we stay in differentiating is a passive process that god puts us through yeah so i actually think differentiating is really intentional so i don't think it's passive i do think god puts us through it so yeah. i think it's a part of his peter scazzaro is, is a is a pastor and just he loves god's word and so he integrates lots of god's word into his writings and so, um, so I'll answer kind of the, the second part. I think it's really intentional. Sure. Sometimes God does this miraculous, you know, Saul to Paul. And although I will say this, okay, even when Paul went through his conversion, he still struggled with his dogmatism, his black and white thinking. He still wanted the law, but yet God was like inspiring him to write Romans, which was grace. And so we will still have our struggles and our ditches that we want to go back in but it is intentional. And then that first part of that question, um, and again, everybody struggles somewhat. It's that old word that came out in the 80s about codependency. But if we aren't differentiated, we tend to take on people's stuff and be people pleasers and have a fear of using our voice. And this is the challenge because marriages make this really tough. Yeah. 
you know, we can't separate from our marriages. Like if I have a tough time with a friend, I can kind of put some distance there and I can, you know, be like, okay, I got to do some, some of my own work with this. And then in marriage, it just heats it up. Yeah. So that's why, I mean, I am a fan of marriage counseling and I'm a fan of spouses reading the book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, for them to do their own work about where they are, especially if we have a spouse that tends to be difficult or toxic. And then usually if that's the case, the other spouse can tend to be a pleaser because they don't want to stir things up. So. Anyway. Yeah, that's good. Hey, here's a question that I like. I like this question as well. What encouragement uh, counsel can you give to those who have been on the receiving end of relational minimalism? They've been cut out of a friend or loved one's life. Yeah. Oh man, that is a good one. Okay. So one of two things probably happened that created the cutout, the cutoff. Either the first one is you, is this person was misperceived and maybe the person that cut them off has their own stuff that they haven't worked, worked on. And so they were like, man, I'm done with you, which by the way, is never okay. If there ever needs to be this, I need complete separation. Really, it's because there, there was abuse. It doesn't mean we have to be everybody's best friend, but there was something there or there was a really big time misperception or misinterpretation that goes back to we're called to be peacemakers. We're called to let me work through hard stuff, but so that we can reconcile this, which means at peace, which is different than restore. Restore means we actually make peace and we're back to being friends or we're back to you know being great coworkers. But sometimes it's just the reconciling piece. But if that's happened and, and we've been cut off, first it's just sad. So I say, you know, we look to hold up a mirror and say, what happened and what was my part in this, if anything? And do I feel led? And it's not black and white, like, oh, you should always go back to the person that cut you off because you might get rewounded again. And that, you know, I have sessions a lot of times, especially in friend in families where there's been a cutoff and the person in my office is really trying to kind of restore that relationship. And I'm just helping them see what are the good things that could happen and what are the not good things that could happen and how might this person respond to you? And are you setting yourself up to get rewounded? Yeah. But if it's about like a misperception or a miscommunication and somebody's overreacted, first of all, that person that overreacted is lower on the differentiation scale and it, it warrants a conversation, but you really want to look at how toxic that friendship was. I mean, to have somebody cut you off says a lot about that person that cut you off. So, yeah, that's good. Uh, boy, the questions keep getting better and better. Um, yeah. um, what do we do if we realize we are the person who is most difficult, toxic in our lives? How do we best go about fixing ourselves short of seeing a counselor or in combination of seeing a counselor? Well, you know, I'm a fan of seeing counselors. Um, so you are. can you believe it? Um, and I think I've said this to you guys before. We actually don't hire counselors at Nikeo who haven't done their own work. So I've done my own work, continue to do my own work. So um, so to kind of answer that one first, I, I do think, and if it's not a counselor, it's, you know, some type of a support group or a church. I do know that there is, I can't, there's two churches here in the area that are actually taking their, whoever will, they don't, you don't have to go through it. One is a church in Richardson. They're actually taking their congregation through the book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, because mm -hmm. they're wanting to avoid drama because yeah. again, the less differentiated you are, typically the more drama we have. And so, um, you know, again, test and examine your ways, look at your own stuff, read a book like that. There's lots of, I mean, I can send Henry, you a list of great books to read. But I think when we process out loud with somebody that has some wisdom, it doesn't mean they're perfect, but has some wisdom that helps us get unstuck. So that's the answer to that one. And then I do love this question too, how we can be peacemakers between friends and family that clash. So let me start with, there's, there's a term called the drama triangle. And in a drama triangle, you're gonna have three people. And even the, the word for that triangle drama is gonna tell you where I'm going here. So you'll have three people. The person up here is typically like kind of the bad guy or the, the persecutor or the perpetrator, like the one that's basically identified as the really difficult person. And then you have this person down here and this is the victim. And this person feels victimized by the bad guy up here. And then you have this third part of the triangle and that's the rescuer. 
And so we need to be careful because peacemakers, every person that's ever come in my office that, that has said initially, hey, I tend to be the peacemaker. And by the way, I was the peacemaker in my family, so I feel like I could speak into this. They end up creating a drama triangle and they don't mean to because you always have three people in a drama triangle because they end up rescuing rather than facilitating healthy, mature conversations. And again, sometimes that can happen and somebody doesn't move into rescuing and they're like, actually, I just kind of help my mom and my sister communicate or there was this clash between the in-laws and then the, and so I just kind of ask questions, but let them really work it out. Cause you know, again, that's what I do as a counselor. I ask the right questions to help resolution happen. And so I would say just really examine what you're doing to not get pulled into a drama triangle when it comes to being a peacemaker. Yeah, yeah that's a that's good a great point. question. Yeah, you know, I, I think too, uh, and you kind of referred to this in the differentiation that do you have people in your life that you've give permission that if there's anything that you think I need, um, you know, I give you a uh, carte blanche to speak into my life on anything. Having those relationships with people is really, really important. Uh, hey, we're about out of time here, unless someone has a last minute question. Liz, thank you so much for the time. Uh, great, great time. I, the, the, the quote, um, uh, love people for how they are while forgiving them for what they are not. That, that's worth the price of admission today. So uh, thank you for that. Um, you know, I love it. There's a great quote by Abraham Lincoln, too. That's one of my favorites. He says, I don't like that man. I must get to know him better. And sometimes Ooh. I think, yeah, yeah, because I think sometimes we can have these difficult people and is part of the problem that I don't know them well. Uh, and so maybe those are the people that we need to invite to lunch just to see if there could be some movement there. But uh, but yeah, this, oh, was, this was so valuable. That's fantastic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll, I'll send that to you. Um, Please do. Yeah, I actually wrote okay. it down. So I'm set. Uh, Kyle said it's not. Oh, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> well, he <laughs> He, he, not a quote, him, not a quote for me. Okay, there you go. So, well, Liz, thank you so much for the time. And thank you all for, for being with us today. Uh, if there's any other help that we can give, uh, please uh, reach out to us. Or if you have a follow-up question with Liz, uh, you know, let me know and I can field some of those questions her way as well. But Liz, thank you again for the time. It's, it's always a, a pleasure and a treasure to have you join us. And this was certainly one of those great days. You bet. You guys take care. Do all right. Thanks, Liz. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.